Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, I hope you have, Gospel of Matthew. You notice I've been here for a while now. Matthew the publican. Matthew the publican. Chapter number 12 and verse number 14. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. Father, bless this holy book now. Give me unction to preach it. Thy name I pray. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament history of Israel, over and over and over again, they fell to idolatry. Solomon didn't help anything when he brought all those foreign women in with their gods. And from that point on, Israel was going down, spiraling down quickly. Eventually, Israel was carried off into Babylonian captivity, the southern two tribes, northern tribes, into Assyrian captivity. But while there, the Pharisee was born. They learned their lesson when it came to idolatry. It was that period of time, 70 years away from their land. Their temple had been destroyed. Priesthood was gone. And they were missing. They were missing dearly their homeland. And this is why Daniel, three times a day, would turn his face toward Jerusalem. And he'd pray faithfully day after day after day, maybe today in Jerusalem. To this very day, Jews all over this world in what's called the diaspora, the diaspora, are praying maybe today in Jerusalem. Because the greatest thing that most of them could do is make aliyah, and that means to come back into their land. So the Pharisee was born. He was born there during the Babylonian captivity, and when they came out, the Pharisee began to grow and establish himself in the very country that he loved, and no question about it, all Pharisees were not hypocrites. Nicodemus was a Pharisee who came to the Lord. He wanted to know the truth. But we find Pharisees here who are against Christ. These Pharisees knew what was called the oral law. The oral law is supposedly what was given to Moses at Sinai. The oral law became the basis for the Mishnah. The Mishnah became the heart of the, of the, uh, of the Koran. Not the Koran, but the Talmud. And the Talmud is what's used today, to this very day, for the Jews to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. A Jew will never reject Christ from the scriptures. He can't do it. So he has to go to his Talmud. And the Talmud is based upon the oral law. So what you're looking at now, with all of that said, you're looking at Pharisees who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They have their reasons, many different reasons, but they have decided to destroy this man. They're going to kill him. They're going to do away with him. Whatever it takes to get him off the face of the earth, they're going to do it because they knew people were following him. They were listening to him, and he had quite a following, and they didn't like that. So in verse number 14, it says the Pharisees went out, and they held a council against him how they might destroy him. Now, they could not deny that what he was doing was miraculous. They couldn't deny that. People were seeing. People were, people were walking and that had been lame. All kinds of miracles were happening to people. And so the Pharisee could not deny that. Here's how he handled it. In verse number 24 of Matthew chapter number 12, And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And so they attributed all these works that Christ was doing, all the miracles that he was doing, they attributed to the work of Satan. In plain words, they said, This man is demon-possessed. And that everything he's doing is doing it by the power of hell. Now you're reading one of the most powerful chapters in all the Bible. For the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew deals with what's called the unpardonable sin. It deals with a sin where there's no pardon in this life or in the life to come. And note carefully what happens here. In verse number 31, Matthew chapter number 12. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven to men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Note carefully. Back up here where it says in verse number 24, what he does, he does with the power of Beelzebub. They didn't say anything about the Holy Spirit here. 
They didn't actively and consciously say anything against the Holy Ghost. What they did was attribute the work that Christ had done, and he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. He told them plainly he did it by the finger of God. The finger of God is what wrote the commandments on the top of Sinai. He said, this is how I did this, and they rejected that. They rejected the power of Christ where it came from. Of course, that would be his identity. And by rejecting that, they placed themselves in a category of rejecting the work of God and rejecting the Holy Spirit of God. God. Now in Matthew in, in John chapter number 16, the Lord Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He'll not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come and he will speak of me and he will convince the world of sin because they believe not on me. Something changes between Matthew chapter number 12 and the coming of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. What is it? The thing that changes so powerfully is that when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, he came to indwell people, every, all people that are believers in Christ, every last one of us have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Before that, the Holy Ghost as the third person of the Trinity was empowering the Lord Jesus Christ to do what he did. But it wasn't a matter of rejecting or accepting the Holy Spirit. They didn't know anything about that. He let them understand. Be very careful about attributing unto the devil the work of God. Be very, very careful. Note what he says in verse number 30, uh, 24, 34 of Matthew chapter number 12. O oh, generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. My friend, no stronger term analogy can be used. The Lord Jesus Christ said you're a generation of snakes. You're a wicked, vile generation. And my dear friend, we're living in a generation like that. Amen. This is what Paul's talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. When they loved not the truth, but took pleasure in unrighteousness. They hated the truth. They hated the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible said because of that, he will send them strong delusion. God does not play games with us. If you have been privileged above all to hear the truth, to hear the word of God, to have the light shining in your soul, you are accountable to God in a way that nothing else is. What are you going to do with that truth my friend what will you do with that truth these rejected him and then because they rejected him look what immediately happens in Matthew chapter 13 immediately upon the fact that the leaders of Israel had rejected him in Matthew chapter number 13 the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside and great multitudes followed him and stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables. He began to speak to them in parables. And you know, my friend, look at verse number 11. Matthew chapter 13. He answered and said unto them, in reference to why speakest thou unto them in parables. He answered in verse 11, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. We plainly see something that is profound that's taking place here. Something is changing before our very eyes. And it would do us well, folks, to note this because this is what makes us understand the New Testament. Without understanding this, we're constantly pulling scriptures out, cherry-picking this, cherry-picking that with the least, least idea of what we're talking about. Look at what he said in Matthew chapter number 10. In Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew 10. Matthew chapter number 10. Look what he says. He says in Matthew chapter number 10 and verse number 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then as you go, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's important. That's a big deal. Yeah. I'm trying to lay out a foundation for you this morning. This is a big deal. 
Because early in his ministry, when he first started his ministry, he did not minister to Gentiles. It was exclusively to Israel and to the Jews. And that's who he dealt with until they took an official council to destroy him that we just read about here in chapter number 12 and verse number 14. And when they took that official council to destroy him, he immediately began to preach to them in parables. Now that's a different message altogether, what's included in parables. But my friend was purposes so that a certain group of people's eyes and mind and ears and heart and soul would be shut off, but another group would be opened up so that they could hear and understand what he was saying. And he told his disciples plainly, as I just read to you in chapter 13 and verse number 11, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. I think this is a wonderful thing. I think the Bible is a wonderful thing. When I begin to study the Bible, it blows my mind at how things begin to open up in Scripture. And we don't really see them unless we do some praying and get a hold of what God's Word says. Now, don't you to notice what it says in the Scriptures. In chapter number 11 and verse number 21, he said, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. That's what he said. So what did he mean by that, preacher? He meant that because they had seen and heard and witnessed the great power of God, because of that, that they were more accountable than Tyre and Sidon because Tyre and Sidon had not had what they had had. Now, my friend, I want you to understand something this morning. I'm preaching the gospel to you. I'm preaching the gospel of the grace of God to you. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He was seen of over 500 brethren at one time. Notice what's not included there. There's nothing about commandments. There's nothing about baptism. There's nothing in that gospel of Christ except the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, is it all that important? It's absolutely that important. Because any time someone tries to drag something in, I, I don't care how well-meaning they may be, I don't care any time somebody tries to add anything to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is an abomination to the gospel. He did it all. It's all paid for. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need anything that man can offer him. What he gave when he gave himself, he gave all that he had. We have those who want to drag you under the law. They want to take you back under the law. Amen. They'll use this part, that part, so forth and so on. I want to read to you from 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse number 13. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him, and the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Did you see that? Then they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth is stone that is dead. It's hard for us today here in this century to understand what that means. I'll tell you what you can do. You can log on to YouTube. And you can do just a little bit of a Google on YouTube. And you'll find out that there are videos on YouTube showing people being stoned to death. You'll hear their cries. You'll hear those stones as they hit their bodies. It is a horrific way to die. It is a terrible, agonizing type of death. Note carefully, this is there in the Old Testament time that Naboth, un not rightly, he was stoned to death. But what I'm trying to get across to you today is this. There was a time on this earth <coughs> when men walked in fear. When men lived in fear, when it was, a, it was what you'd call an archaic time, it was, a, it was a time that is totally divorced from the world that you live in today. They tell us that some of those people over there in Afghanistan have been stoned. Those people in Afghanistan have been run through. I watched a thing yesterday because of the kind of mind that I've got. I watched a thing yesterday where a young woman was taken before the Taliban. And the Taliban questioned her and she'd committed adultery. And they told her, they said, you have chosen to do what you did. Now you're going to pay the price under Allah. 
and, would, and, and, and they said to her, confess what you did to Allah. And her father was standing there. Her father was standing there. And she confessed what she did. And she said to her father, would you forgive me? Please forgive me. Her father said, no, I cannot forgive you for what you've done. And he turned away from her. And, they, and, 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 and the Muslim that's going to stone her to death said, forgive her, forgive her, forgive her. And finally, after being urged and coached to do it time and again, he finally said to his daughter, you're forgiven. And you could hear her as she whimpered because she knew she was about to die a horrendous death. Then you could hear the stones as they began to hit her body. How would you like to live under a religion like that? How would you like to live under the religion of Allah? Well, let me tell you something, folks. These people in the Old Testament weren't that too far, weren't that far from it. Because when you can just take somebody and drag him out into the street and stone him to death, we've got a problem going on, don't we? We really do have a problem. Over there in the book of Numbers chapter 15, verse 32, it says this. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. That's pretty bad stuff, don't you think? All he was trying to do was gather sticks so he could build a fire for his family so they could eat. But he was doing it on the Sabbath day. Why so harsh, preacher? Because God is revealing his holiness. And you don't want to stand in the presence of the holiness of God. He had to prepare people for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said that the Old Testament was our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. You know the man that is thankful for forgiveness? It's the man that's been forgiven. You want to talk about a man that is humble? It's a man that's been forgiven. You want to talk about a man that has power with God? It's a man that's been forgiven. If you really know what it is to be forgiven, and you ever have really accepted in your soul what it means to be forgiven, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Humility is one of the greatest gifts there is. The Bible said, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. I wouldn't want to live back then. I would not have wanted to live in a culture where they could take me and stone me to death. Would you? Would any of you in here this morning? You wouldn't want to live there. You wouldn't want to live there at all. And so I'm going to speed up here and come to a woman taken in adultery. In John chapter number 8 and verse number 3. We're living still under that old custom, that old commandment, that old culture. And they, and they take her and they, and they drag her before Christ. And they expect her to be stoned to death. And they're going to watch her die. And they're going to watch her blood run out into the ground. And they're going to feel good because they did something for God. It's going to give them this religious high experience when they watch her die. And so they drug her to Christ. The scribes and Pharisees brought him a woman taken in adultery. And when they'd set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master... This woman was taken in adultery at the very act. Now Moses. So they're going to pit Christ against Moses. Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? And so they laid it at his feet. Here is Moses. Now who are you? Moses in the law taught us. Now what are you going to say? You see what they're doing? That's called baiting. They were baiting him for the answer from, this, from the Lord Jesus. And of course, my dear friend, if you drag a sinner to Christ, that's the best place you can take him. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's their first mistake, is bringing a sinner to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Don't drag him to your church. Don't drag him to you. Don't drag him to your ministry. Don't drag him to this. Bring him to Christ. Because yeah. he's the only one that can help him. And so he says to them, he wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he heard them not. So while they were screaming and yelling to kill her and stone her, he simply writes on the ground. And so when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Whichever one of you are ready to start this process, go right ahead. Without sin among you. Wait a minute. Who qualifies for that? Wait a minute. 
who wait just a minute who without sin among you why i'll tell you right now that couldn't be me i couldn't stone her no i'm a sinner thanks be unto god for his unspeakable gift i'm the chief of sinners hallelujah to god for forgiveness i know what it is to be forgiven not on a stoner uh, somebody that's been forgiven they wouldn't want a stoner They'd walk over there and they'd wipe the sweat off of her face and take her by the hand and say, let me tell you something. Let me tell you what the Lord did for me and let me tell you what he can do for you. Now look at this. Look at it very carefully though. And so the Bible says, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning the eldest, even the last. Jesus was left alone, a woman stand in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted it up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Wait just a minute. Here's another point in the Bible. This is a line of demarcation. This is a separation. This is a powerful thing. For up until this point, they could take them and stone them. But no, the Lord Jesus Christ never picked up a stone and stoned anybody. No. Do you know why? Because he's the servant of the Lord. Yeah. That's why. Remember what it says in Isaiah 42 and verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment to truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till they have set judgment in the earth, and the owl shall wait for his law. Now, wait a minute. This woman taken in adultery, and nowhere does it say she's a pagan. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that she's an unbeliever. No. She's just a woman that got caught. That's right. yeah. Of course, you know, you've heard a thousand, where's the man? Well, they didn't bring him. He's probably one of the Pharisees. Who knows? Let me tell you something, folks. The church is shot full of adultery, fornication, yeah. pornography. The church houses today, the, the, I think, I figured what it was, something like 40% of the reverends in the pulpit that answered the survey said that they were addicted or been, hook, been watching pornography. Got a lot of power here, don't we? Yeah. Now, are you making fun of the church? No. But I'm not going to hide behind it either. Amen. We're not going to create this straw man. We're not going to put this thing out for you and say, well, now you know there's a holiness about us. No, there's a holiness about Christ. Amen. Not us. Amen. Not us. Not us. Look carefully. She was either a bruised reed or a smoking flax. I would say she was a bruised reed, wouldn't you? Amen. Something had happened to this woman. Who knows? I don't know her life. But I know one thing. I know that you don't just all of, a cut, all of a sudden become an adulterer. You become an adulterer because you picked a path to go down. And the path that you picked to go down leads you to adultery. I know that. I know that the eye, the eye can feed the soul. And I know a man is drawn by what he sees. A woman is drawn by what she feels. And I'm going to tell you right now that that path to adultery can be filled with primroses. It can be filled with the most beautiful music you ever heard. And you'll think it's the most wonderful thing in the world as you begin to have an affair on your wife or your husband. And you think that this, why did I miss this? I mean, this is what, this is the, I deserve it, I'm me. And you hear this message day in and day out pumped into your soul. But it's still adultery. God condemns it. But look how he handles it now in the New Testament. And I want to show you the difference between that Old Testament law and the New Testament. He never one time condoned it. What he said to her is, go sin no more. Amen. Stop it. Cease what you're doing. Go sin no more. He didn't approve of it, but he said, I don't condemn you. What are you what's that mean? I'm not going to stone you to death. Amen. That's what he said. Right. Go and sin no more. So the apostle Matthew quotes Isaiah 42 and says, a bruised reed shall he not break and smoking flax shall he not quench. If your faith is just about dried up in your soul and you have every reason in the world to turn against God and walk out of the church, God didn't do that. If you've been to a church house where some, something happened to you, I got an email from some folks a few years ago and they said, Preacher, 
We've been faithful members in our church for years and years and years and years. Faithful. We love our church. We love our people. But this new pastor and this new ministry has moved into this church. And they are, bra they are, and they are taking this church in the direction of seeker-sensitive. Uh, seeker-sensitive. And what's the other term for it? There's another one. Uh, uh, Purpose-driven life. Okay? They said that to me. They said, this is what they're doing. And said, preacher, when they realized that we were not going to be part of that, that we wanted to stay with the old ways, they got rid of us. How'd they get rid of us? They turned on us. No longer a hand, friendship. They turned against us. And I could tell when she wrote that to me, she was a bruised reed. Her, she was bruised. She'd been hurt in church. I know of preachers that have had, they were serial fornicators. Preachers now, serial fornicators. Right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Right here, good old Knoxville, Tennessee. And I know the people that were victims of this, husbands, who were victims of this, became bruised reeds because they say, I put my trust in you, preacher, and you took my wife, and look what you did with her. I know of cases where pastors have, have uh, molested children, little children, little children. Let me warn, let me warn you now, if you're going to mess with kids, when they put you in prison, they're going to mess with you. Even the inmates in prison despise people that mess with children. Yeah, they do. Just the other day, one, one was slaughtered in one of the prisons because he was, a he was a child molester and wound up in prison. He didn't last any time. They killed him right there in his cell. I'm not saying that's good. I'm not condoning that. I'm trying to tell you something. The only hope you have of getting out of that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ, not excuses, but come to the one who will not Take that bruise and bruise you more. Then there's the smoking flax. Smoking flax. What's that mean? That means that you have just a little bit of faith left. Very little. Just a little. Just a little. Maybe your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter died. A few years ago out there on Chapman Highway, it was a horrible wreck. Horrible. Lord God Almighty. Horrible. And the man was in the car, and I could hear him screaming as he was being burned alive. Can you imagine anything worse than that? And his wife heard it. Heard it. See, he was a Christian. That's the way he died. The same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Okay. He's burned alive. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the smoking flax? Can you imagine how much faith she might have had in God when something like that happened? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You can have stuff happen to you that you never expected. It could happen to me, folks. I'm not exempt from this stuff. Amen. But I'm trying to tell you something. If it does happen to you, the Lord Jesus Christ will not make it worse. He will not kick you down. If you'll come to him, he'll calm you. He's the balm of Gilead. Yes. And he'll pick you back up. And he'll reestablish you in the faith. And he'll bless your soul. That's the difference between Achan being stoned to death and the man on the Sabbath day was stoned to death because he picked up sticks. There's a big difference between being stoned to death for picking up sticks and one who says, come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest for your souls. The Lord Jesus Christ is the most precious thing that's ever happened to this world. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one that will motivate you and give you a reason to live. The Lord Jesus Christ is beautiful in every sense of the word and beauty of holiness. All surrounds him completely. The Lord Jesus Christ has never had one thing in his mind other, other than your good, what will help you. What will save you? What can, he, what can he do for you? That's the Son of God. All good things come from him. What's the difference? The Burke's Church of Galatians over there, they wanted to drag him under the law. I have a short fuse with people that come to me and say, Preacher, we need to keep the Sabbath. I've got a Sabbath. It's Christ. 
Somebody else comes to me and says, Preacher, we need to keep living right or we're not going to be saved. I read you from that treatise the other day. You remember that thing was brought in here, CD, music, and they had their little page on there and was talking about how that, oh, yeah, the initial salvation was the wording in it. Okay, I knew right then we had a problem. But you go ahead and read the thing. It even talks about if you have bad thoughts, <laughs> bad thoughts yeah. that you can go to hell even after you're saved for having bad thoughts. Gets real wild, doesn't it? But two things are missing. Two things are missing from their treatise about salvation. One is the new birth and blood. And that's two of the most important things in the Bible. You know where it's coming from, don't you? I'm going to tell you, I don't want to be mad. That I'm not going to be mean to anybody, but I'm going to tell you right now where that came from. It came straight out of hell. Salvation is not what you can do. Salvation is what he's done for you. Paul said he's able to keep that which I've commended to him against that day. He can keep, sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, name written in the Lamb's book of life. And no man can blot that name out. Thanks be unto God today for his unspeakable gift. I've known of Christians who have literally lost their mind. They become senile. They have, they have uh, Alzheimer's. You know, they're gone. They're gone. Their mind's gone. Okay. Did they lose their salvation when that happened? No. I know of Christians that have gone back into drugs. They've gone back into dope. Drugs have a horrible hold upon your body. In your heart and in your soul, you want to, learn, you want to serve the Lord. You want to live for God. But your body, it's that, it's that, it's that, it's that you know, you're, you're hooked. You're, 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 a, you're a drug addict. And, and so what, which one is it, preacher? The body cannot send you to hell. The body cannot send you to hell. Rejecting Christ is what sends you to the pit. The unpardonable sin is that sin where the Lord Jesus Christ comes down upon your soul. He makes the Holy, the Holy Spirit comes down upon your soul. He makes Christ real in your life. He introduces you to the Savior. For the first time in your life, you know you're lost now. You know, you don't need to be pumped up. You don't, you don't need any more positive affirmation. You're, you're throwing that up now. The Holy Spirit comes to you and says, you're a sinner. You have to agree with him because you are. And you're not going to be able to change your life. It's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. You have to agree with him. And then you agree with the Holy Spirit when he says, the Lord Jesus Christ is who you need. That's who you need. And he'll save your soul. And if you choose to reject that, there's no forgiveness in this world or the world to come. Because you've rejected the only way of salvation there is. My, my, my. What a sad thing. Sad. Sad. Paul called the law the ministration of death, and he called it the curse. That's what he called it. He called it the ministration of death, and he called it the curse. Father, bless your word now. Bless your word. Help somebody with it this morning. Your holy name I pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. Won't you come today, first time in your life, you ever done it? Won't you come this morning? Come down here and talk to the Lord. Talk to him. He'll talk to you. Talk to God.